All right, let me pray for us, and uh, then we'll dive in. God, thank you so much for your word. Psalm 119 tells us that you are good and do good. And so teach us your statutes. Knowing, God, your, your goodness, uh, having tasted of your goodness already uh, in your word and in salvation, God, we pray that you would just continue to uh, demonstrate the same goodness of your character and that you would be merciful and gracious with us this morning and let us taste the the fruit of just sitting under your instruction i pray that you would even grant me clarity as i uh deliver your word and that you would be pleased to use this uh, message to sanctify your church further and we pray all this in christ's name Amen. This morning, we're going to be in a psalm, Psalm 46. And I've been uh, just eager recently to preach more psalms as I've been increasingly impressed with this book in our Bibles. And so by way of introduction this morning, in hopes to uh, prepare us a little bit, for what we'll find in Psalm 46. Uh, I want to have you turn first to 1 Chronicles, the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 25. 1 Chronicles 25. Probably not a book of the Bible that you find yourself in often, but this is a helpful preparation for what we'll find in Psalms because first Chronicles records what David did in appointing these men who wrote the Psalms. They led the nation in worship, led the nation in song. And so David being known as the sweet Psalmist of Israel appointed other men to oversee and accompany him in leading the nation and singing to the Lord. And there's a particular aspect of First Chronicles 25 that I want to draw our attention to. So let me just read this passage, and then I'll, I'll show us what we need to see. Moreover, David and the commanders of the army set apart for the service some of the sons of Asaph, and of Heman and Jedithan, who were to prophesy with lyres, harps, and cymbals. And the number of those who performed their service was of the sons of Asaph, Zakur, Joseph, Nethaniah, and Asherel, Asherela. The sons of Asaph were under the direction of Asaph, who prophesied under the direction of of the king. Verse 3 of Jedathan, the sons of Jedathan, Jedaliah, Zerai, Jeshiah, Shimei, Hashabiah, and Mattathiah, six under the direction of their father, Jedathan, with the harp, who prophesied in giving thanks and praising Yahweh. Verse 4 of Heman, the sons of Heman, Bukiah, Mataniah, Uziel, Shubiel, Shubiel, and Jeremoth, Hananiah, Hanani, Eliatha, Gidalti, and Romam Tezer, Josh Bekasha, Malathai, Hothir, Masahiah, excuse me, Mahazioth, and then verse 5, all of these were the sons of Heman, the king's seer, to exalt him according to the words of God, for God gave 14 sons and three daughters to Heman. What's helpful about these verses, not so much having to pronounce all the names, 
But what is helpful is multiple times you notice prophecy coming up. The people who wrote the Psalms, even some of these Psalms are introduced by the names of the leaders of these families, Asaph, Heman, uh, most notably. It says over and over again, multiple times in the first uh, five verses, that these were those who prophesied. Just look again at verse one, who were to prophesy with these musical instruments, lyres, harps, cymbals, etc. And then again, verse two, these prophesied under, under the direction of the king. And then you have again in verse three, who prophesied in giving thanks and praising Yahweh. And then in verse five, it mentions that Heman was the king's seer, another word for a prophet. So what's the significance of having prophets write your music? If you're David, if you're King David, he's, all of these men are under his authority, under his instruction, and he has appointed the singers, songwriters, leaders of music in Israel who are prophets. To say it a different way, why would you want a prophet to sing or a singer to prophesy? And the answer is actually quite simple. It's that they were writing about, they were singing about the future. These writers of the Psalms mimicked or modeled what David exemplified. David was a writer of music for the nation, and he was also a prophet. And besides that, he held the unique position of king, obviously. But this is helpful for us in seeing uh, the Psalms and reading the Psalms, because what would you expect to come from prophets who wrote music? You would expect prophecy. You would expect prophecy. And so if in all of your reading and studying of the Psalms, if the category of prophecy is perhaps lacking, then just expand your thinking about the Psalms to include this what I would say is an overwhelming element of the Psalms of prophecy. The Psalms oftentimes are prophetic. They're not merely uh, demonstrating personal experience. They're not merely these men reflecting on a personal uh, relationship with God or Israel's corporate relationship with God. But oftentimes you will find a prophetic element in the Psalms, if not in total, then at least in part, or there are statements about the future all throughout many of the Psalms. And Psalm 46 is no exception to that. So turn to Psalm 46. And as we study this Psalm today, we will find that aspect, that element of the Psalms very clear and prevalent in these words. Psalm 46 begins, For the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah, set to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear when the earth should change and when the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, when its waters roar and foam, when the mountains quake at its swelling pride. Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. 
God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice, the earth melted. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. Come, behold the works of Yahweh who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Selah. With three different movements, this song compels us to make God our refuge. That's what Psalm 46 is doing in three different movements. With three movements in this song, this song compels us to make God our refuge. These movements in the song uh, being distinct elements of the song, distinct portions of the song is what movements are. And you can see this in the song because they're each offset by the word Selah. You see that three times that that phrase appears in the text after verse three, after verse seven, and then at the end of the psalm, after verse 11. Um, this would have probably, it's, it's not clear entirely what Selah is denoting, not clear to us. Certainly to Israel, this would have been uh, completely obvious what that term means or what the musicians are doing at that point or what the congregation is required to do. But it is helpful, even without being able to understand entirely what the phrase means, it's easy to see in studying the psalm that the Selah denotes three distinct portions or movements included in the song. And I'll just give you all three of these up front and then we'll work our way through them. The first movement is an anticipation of cataclysm. An anticipation of cataclysm. The second movement is an exaltation from stability. And the third and final movement is an invitation into rest. That's what each of these uh, elements is doing in the song. And it's really phenomenal the way the sons of Korah work their way through each of these things and how each element on its own encourages the nation, encourages those who sung the Psalms or who still do sing the Psalms to make God our refuge. That's the entire thrust is that those who sing the, these words, those who read these words and who study them would make God our refuge. And so the Psalm begins with these words, that title that appears there in the English for the choir director and following that is a part of the inspired text. And so this was a song. <laughs> these were words given to whomever at that time was directing the choir. Uh, this was written obviously for successive generations in mind. And so it has the instructions for the choir director. This is of the sons of Korah, meaning the, the song came from them. It was written by them. You'll remember perhaps from uh, Numbers chapter 16, Korah was that man who had set himself up against Moses and against Aaron. This was shortly after the nation refused to go finally into the promised land in rebellion against God, the Levites had a particularly unique place in the nation, in their service of the temple. Everybody wasn't of the family of Aaron. And so everyone was not tasked with being priest. That was just for Aaron's own line. And yet Korah being a Levite wanted not only the unique place that the Levites held, 
but the unique position that Aaron's family had in being priests who offered sacrifices. And so if you're familiar with that story, you know that the ground eventually opened up as God's way of demonstrating who was his man, Moses. It was Aaron and not anyone else. And so Korah, Numbers records, and all his household were swallowed up when the earth opened. But still we see further along in scripture in this and many other Psalms that they were written by the sons of Korah. And you just have to ask the question, where in the world did they come from? In Numbers 14, 13 and 14, the nation was uh, all, everyone who was counted 20 years old and up perished in the wilderness. If Korah had sons 20 years and older, they would have died as a part of God's judgment in the wilderness. And if they weren't above 20 years old, they would have still been a part of Korah's household that was swallowed up when the earth opened. And so you have to ask, how in the world did any of Korah's descendants survive those two judgments of God? Well, I think the reason that these Psalms have survived under the title of the sons of Korah is because even as young men under the age of 20 who would have survived the wilderness generation, there was a call by Moses to separate yourself from these rebellious men, Korah and the ones who joined themselves with him in the rebellion. And so the only way I think the descendants of Korah would have survived is if they were young men and yet who had the courage and conviction to separate themselves from this rebellious man, their rebellious father. And so this, even the title, in the title of this psalm, we have an enduring testimony that this line of men were men of faith who over against everyone else sided with God. And so even the titles that bear their name remind us of their history. This would have been a song that came from them it was set to Alamoth, that word just meaning young women or virgins, uh, probably indicating uh, something about who was supposed to be singing or the key that it was supposed to be sung in. It was fit for them. And it, then it simply says a song. This is a song. This was intended to be sung. And with the singing of this song would have come reminders and encouragement and instruction so that every single time the nation lifted up their voice or made their way to the tabernacle or to the temple, they would have heard these words and been reminded and instructed to make God their refuge. In this first movement, in verses 1 to 3, there is an anticipation of cataclysm. And cataclysm just being an event uh, in nature that is incredibly or extremely destructive. That is what it means for something to be cataclysmic. And here, this is what we see described. That comes after this initial word in verse one is the declaration. Under, in the, within this first movement describing or anticipating cataclysm, we get this declaration in verse one. God is our refuge. God is our refuge. And that becomes the consistent refrain throughout the rest of the song. God is our refuge. And added to that, God is our strength. What it means to be a, a refuge is a safe place. A refuge is a safe place where enemies and danger cannot harm the one safely placed in the refuge. The second statement is like it. 
God is our strength. He is not only our refuge, he is our strength. And that word is similar, probably what's being communicated there when it uses the word strength uh, could also be translated a strong, and that's to imply a stronghold. Like a refuge, like a safe place, God is for us a stronghold, an unassailable fortress where enemies cannot reach us, where danger cannot touch us. God for us is that. He must be. The one for whom God is a refuge, the one for whom God is a stronghold, is also a very present help in trouble. Uh, could be translated a helper who is abundantly available in distress. That is who God is. That is his character. Characteristically, regardless of how things seem around us, this is who God is. Always and forever, immutably so. He does not change. He is one who is a helper, who is abundantly available, even in the most distressing of times. This is who God is. This gets translated a very present help. And if you're reading the New American Standard Bible, you have that phrase abundantly available. That's the idea. He's not hard to find. When distress comes upon us, when we find ourselves in some sort of turmoil or trouble, we don't have to go looking for God. He already is there. He is available and abundantly so. To a great degree, God is available. And not just as a bystander. If someone is, uh, if you're in some trouble and a child is near you, you would never look to them for help. You wouldn't count on them being able to help if you found yourself in some severe trouble. Because they perhaps lack the strength. They're not strong. God is not like that. He is not only available, he is not a helpless bystander, but he is abundantly available. He is already a helper. And so God is all of these things, a refuge for us, a stronghold for us, a helper to us. He's abundantly available. And so what would be the proper response, the next logical implication for one who believes these remarkable truths about God, for the one who has retreated to God as a refuge, depends on God as a stronghold, believes that God is a helper and is also abundantly available, then what? Verse 2 tells us, therefore, or literally on thus, on this truth, we will not fear. We will not fear. Literally, the person who believes this about God, who believes verse 1, that is a sufficient truth to never fear. Afraid of what? God is a refuge. He's a stronghold. All of my strength and safety is derived from him. He's never far, but he's always abundantly available and able and willing to help me. I have nothing to fear. No circumstances at all are worthy of my fear if I believe this about God. If this is true, on thus, we will not fear. Can you say this of yourself? <clears throat> Do you so believe, verse 1, that all fear departs from you? In your most trying circumstances, in your most devastating moments, in the greatest ev fearful events, can you say, I am not afraid? Come what may, I will not fear. If we are not able to say that in sincerity, 
then it's only because we have not fully embraced the truth of verse one. The psalmists, when they call to mind this fortifying reality of verse one, what they don't do is look to lesser things to prove this truth is sufficient to dispel all fear. In other words, they don't look to small troubles to say, see, we won't fear because God is a stronghold. God is a refuge for us. They fast forward to the worst distress. They fast forward in time to a day when the worst trouble is happening as proof that there is still nothing to fear for those to whom God is a refuge and strength and this very present help in trouble. Verse two says, therefore we will not fear. Most English translations render this, though the earth should change, though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar in foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. There's a, there's a translation issue uh, here. And the way this is constructed in the Hebrew an infinitive phrase front loaded with this particular Hebrew letter is the surest way in the original language to denote a time, the timing of something. It's called a temporal clause. And so if you wanted to say when something happens, you would write it exactly like the sons of Korah wrote this in the Hebrew. And so this is better translated, not as a concessive idea, even though this might happen, even though this might happen, this, the better way to translate this is when this happens, we will not fear. And so all of those in verse two, the four times the word though is mentioned is better translated when. So when the earth should change, And when the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, when its waters roar and foam, when the mountains quake at its swelling pride. When that happens, what's true for the one who has made God, who depends on God as a refuge and a stronghold, to whom he is abundantly available for help, in distress, when those things occur, what's true of them? Verse two, we will not fear. We will not fear. When those cataclysmic events take place, there's still nothing to be afraid of for us, for those who have made God their refuge, for those to whom God is these things listed in verse one. What's the significance of the difference? If you might be reading thinking, well, I liked this psalm before I came to equipping hour this morning. Um, I like the those, although in the repetition that might be there. What's the difference? Here's the difference. The way it's written as is in most English translations Uh, There was one translation I could find that had the win. But the way it's written here, it makes it sound almost hypothetical, like it's imaginary. Hey, even if this were to happen, not that it ever would, because earth is firm, mountains don't really move, they're stable. But, you know, even if that could happen, we, we still wouldn't be afraid. And yeah, that's true. It could be true. But the word, when it's translated in the better way, when, it actually anticipates, it, it at least makes available for the reader a time when this could be a reality. When these things occur, then there's still nothing to fear. And it's no 
accident. It's not, it's no irony that when we continue reading in scripture, we find out that the kinds of cataclysmic events listed in verses two and three in this psalm actually take place. They actually take place. On the day of the Lord, these things will happen. Verse two, the earth will make change. The earth will make change. The earth being changed by God, by specifically by God's judgments, when he takes vengeance on earth dwellers, sinners still on earth, the earth will change absolutely everything. Everything will change when the earth changes. What else will happen? The mountains will slip or literally shake into the heart of the seas. Emily and I spent some time in Hawaii recently celebrating our our 10 year anniversary. We uh, went snorkeling for the first time and they were pointing out as we went around the big island, you can see just where the, the mountain, there's, there's no distinction. It just drops right off into the ocean. You can't see the bottom of the mountain because it's down there in the water. To imagine those mountains no longer being stable, but in such an event that those mountains actually shake off into the water, is absolutely incredible. What's that going to be like when that happens? Who's going to feel safe and not be afraid when that happens? Well, those who, to whom God is a refuge and a stronghold and abundantly available help in time of trouble, that's who. They won't have anything to fear when that time comes. Even verse 3 the waters, that is the waters of the heart of the seas. That's the, the reference to its waters. Who, whose waters? What waters? The, the waters that belong to the heart of the seas will roar. They will foam. You don't see foam in the middle of the ocean. You see foam on the top of waves. And so what's being communicated here is that even the waters found in the midst, at the very middle or innermost part of the ocean, they get turned up. They get brought up to the surface. These these are not the kinds of waves that you go surfing in. These are destructive tsunami kinds of waves where the heart of the sea is brought all the way up to the top, overturning the waters, turning up the earth, toppling mountains. And so again, you can imagine if that kind of activity is happening, what's happening to the mountains? Clearly they are quaking. They are quaking at the swelling pride or the roaring of these waters. So this is the anticipated cataclysm that's pictured in the first few verses. And again, because this is anticipated, because the writers of the song are saying when this comes, then it just begs the question again, have you made God your refuge? Have you looked to him as a stronghold? So that when this event happens, you have nothing to fear. Do you find comfort and safety in things outside of God? Do you stake your hope on promises he has not made? Things that you've imagined in your own mind. Things about what won't happen to you what you don't want to occur, the safety that if I live in a particular neighborhood or 
make my surroundings and life circumstances these things. If I keep a good, well-paying job, I can be safe. A rich man's wealth is like a high wall in his imagination, Proverbs says. Right? Even wealth is uncertain. The uncertainty of riches, Paul calls it in 1 Timothy 6. People who look to those things, to money, family, people, circumstances as a refuge, as a place of safety, they are not safe and they will find themselves oftentimes fearful. Those who look to God as a refuge, those who believe verse 1, who cling to verse one with a white knuckle grip, they are the ones who are promised safety, no need to fear when these events take place. The second movement of this psalm is an exaltation, an exaltation from stability, from stability. Just look at verse four. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The, the difference, um, the introduction to this psalm of a river is jolting. What happened to the waters being overturned, the heart of the oceans of the seas being overturned and the mountains quaking? And then literally it can just be read, a river. And then it describes the actual river. Its channels will gladden the city of God. That is just, weren't we just talking about the earth being destroyed, the mountains quaking, falling off into the sea, tsunami type activity, and then an introduction into the psalm of a river? That's intentional. That makes me think that the Selah at the end of verse three indicates some sort of shift in the actual, if, if not the instruments, the music that's playing, then certainly a shift in the topic, the theme of the song being addressed in the moment. And so it cues all of the listeners, all of the singers, all of the readers that we're shifting now. This is a different movement. It would have been natural at this point in the song for there to be some sort of shift musically, perhaps. There's no way to know just from the words. But to think of this song being sung, the accompanying music shifting with the actual subject being addressed seems fitting. There is a river introduced, and it's said about this river that its streams make glad the city of God. There really isn't any record of a river that ran through Jerusalem in this way. Uh, A river, especially uh, large enough to have tributaries that could be useful to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's what's in view, Jerusalem, the city of God. And so what's going on there? Um, what's, what's being talked about if in Israel's history, there hasn't ever been a, a river that fits this description, then what do you do with that? Let me just tell you what some commentators do with this. My favorite commentary on the Psalms uh, by William Plummer One of the reasons that uh, this is my favorite is because he tells you what everybody else says about interpretive challenges. So it's like a one-stop shop for knowing what other commentaries on the psalm have to say. And he just records a plethora of interpretations given to verse 4. Let me just read them for you so you kind of know what's being attempted. Plummer records this. As Edwards, one commentator, thinks the stream is the holy place. So he makes the stream the same thing as the holy place is mentioned in verse 4. Calvin Diodati 
Green and others think the imagery is drawn from the small streams which watered Jerusalem. Well, the problem you have with that is that the singular river is mentioned first before the streams, all seeming to be located in the city of Jerusalem, or at least in close enough proximity to be immediately useful. Another, he goes on, by stream, Watts understands scripture. So this interpreter takes the river to be scripture. And the, the issue you have with, um, with that is you move into the realm of allegory. There's no indication that we should take this as scripture. Henry takes it as God's word and, and ordinances. So the river being God's word, streams being ordinances, at least he's trying to do, you know, deal with the plural and singular uses of river, singular, streams, plural, but that doesn't work either. That's allegorical. Scott takes it as the graces and consolations of the Holy Spirit. That's interesting. Morrison takes it as the overflowing stream of divine mercy, which gladdens the saints. Hingstenberg interprets it of the stream of the blessings of the kingdom of God. And he cites a, a wealth of passages after another commentator, Ainsworth. And then Plummer adds his interpretation, the streams of spiritual blessings flowing from God through Jesus Christ by the Holy Ghost make glad the city of God continually. How does he arrive at that interpretation? He says, Jerusalem was the type of the true church of all ages. There's nothing textually to tell us that the stream means any of those things. And so I want to just add my own suggestion, which hopefully this uh, adds clarity. I think we should take the river as being a river and the streams as being streams. And even though in Israel's day, there was no river or streams in the city of Jerusalem, if this anticipates a time future, then why not just assume that this is a time in the future when a river will be in Jerusalem and streams readily available? We won't, we won't look there, but you can write down Zechariah 14. Zechariah, who came after this was written, records a time when, voila, a stream runs through Jerusalem. God splits the city, the mountain, the Mount of Olives, and forces a stream to run through it. And so at a future day, this will be true. There will be a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The city of God being, I appreciate how the Lexham English Bible translates this, the holiest of the dwellings of the Most High. God who's abundantly available, available everywhere in distress, the most holy place where he dwells is the city of God. The city of God, Jerusalem or Zion, is the holiest of the dwellings of the Most High. And on this future day, <clears throat> being anticipated, this will be visibly true. It will be the holy place of God in a way that it hasn't been yet. What will be the case? Verse five, God is in the midst of her in this time. She will not be moved or literally shaken. She being the city will not be shaken. God is in her midst. God, the king on this day will dwell in Jerusalem. This holy God, this holy king will dwell in this most holy city. And so she will not be shaken. That phrase is the same phrase used in verse 2 
or excuse me, in, uh, in verse 2, the mountains will shake or slip into the heart of the sea. The mountains, though they shook and were destabilized, what's true of this city on this day is that it will not be shakable. It will never be shaken. This same language is used in Psalm 15, a reference to the people who dwell one day on God's holy hill, on God's holy mountain, Zion. This is where Jerusalem is located. That entire Psalm, Psalm 15, ends with this same language. The one who gets to dwell there will never be shaken. What's being pictured here is an unshakable people in an unshakable city, Jerusalem. It will not be moved again. And when will this happen? Why will this happen? Verse five says, God will help her, the city. God will prove to be the abundantly available help that we already know he is on this day when morning dawns. Or it could be read, God will help her resulting in morning dawning. It's a difficult way to translate that. This, if, if it hasn't been clear already, that this is a new day after the cataclysm that was anticipated, then this makes it even clearer. Morning dawns. What's being said there? There's a day coming when God will prove to be abundant help for Jerusalem. And when that day comes, it will be a new day. No more instability for Jerusalem. No more cataclysmic event when God is overturning mountains and the oceans, the seas. On this day, when God proves to be help, it will result in, his help to Jerusalem will result in a completely new day. That day is coming. Verse six summarizes everything that's been said such, uh, so far. The nations roar. Nations roar, kingdoms shake. He, when he raised his voice, the earth melted or wavered. It's a hearkening back to verses two and three. That happened, but no more. All it took was for God to give the word to raise his voice and produce that. And so, verse 7, Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh of armies is with us. We're on his side. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. And so, again, you have the refrain, God being a refuge or stronghold for us. If you want the abundantly available help that God is, that God provides, if you want to not have to fear when this day of cataclysm arrives, if you want to exult and be glad when this city of Jerusalem is made stable, after the nations have made an uproar and the kingdoms have tottered, if you want to see this kingdom that does not totter will not be moved, you must make God your refuge today. Don't wait till this new day. Today is the day to make God your refuge. Finally, the third movement in this psalm is an, an, is an invitation into rest, into peace and shalom. Verse 8, come, 
Behold the works of Yahweh who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot with fire. Again, this is what happened. He wrought desolations or the word there meaning events that cause astonishment that cause and provoke awe. He did that on that day. He appointed, he produced these events that cause astonishment and awe on the earth. And so there's an invitation for the nation before those things happen to see them in a sense of uh, through the eyes of faith, if you will, see this, come, behold this day. And then what else? Verse nine, a time when wars are no more. All across the earth, worldwide, there are no wars. No silly personal Squirmishes, uh, no civil wars within nations and no wars across nations. That time is past is what's being pictured here in verse nine. God has done this. He has made wars to cease. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot with fire. Why? Why are these instruments of war, these weapons, Broken, cut up, chariots burned with fire. Well, if you can imagine a time when war is no more, then what are weapons good for? The things pictured here. Make the bows firewood. Use the chariot as kindle for fire. You'll never have to ride in it again. That time is coming when God makes wars to cease all across the world and every weapon, your precious guns included, are no longer useful as weapons of war. Then verse 10, here's the application. If these things are true, if you're singing this song, believing the words that you're singing, believing the words that you're reading, then what? Well, here's what we should do. The application is to stop and know something. Just be still, break from your daily activity, and call this to mind. I am God. I am God is what God requires of us. If we believe this psalm, then we need to take time to remember this fact. God is God. Our God is the God, the only God, the only one who could make this happen, the only one who could be abundantly available for help in distress, the only one worthy of being our refuge, the only one worthy of depending on for strength, Know that he is God. Do you take time? Do you schedule time? I don't know. Maybe you make it a reminder on your phone. Siri, remind me to know that God is God every day at two o'clock. Do you wake up in the morning purposing the most important thing for me to remember despite all the activity I have, all the tasks and responsibility that I must fulfill, what's most important for me is to remember God is God today. Plan for that. Schedule that. Do what you must to make, make that reminder readily available to you. If you were in Israel, you would have written this on Uh, your gates, over your doors, possibly on your clothing, if if that's what the tassels are. (laughs) Practice that. 
How many ways can you remind yourself of these precious truths? This God that we are told to stop and know that he is God, this is the one who will be exalted. Where? Among the nations and on the earth. God will be exalted. So that means he will be king. He will prove his dominion, not just in a sovereign providential way from heaven, but look again, verse 10, where will he make his dominion tangible and evident? He will be exalted in the earth, on the earth. It could also be translated in the land. So this means either worldwide or specifically in Jerusalem, whichever of those is the case here in view. Both are true. God will prove his worldwide dominion from the capital city of the world, Jerusalem, one day. Again, Zechariah 14 says that he will be king and the only one. He will be king of the entire world. So, since that is the case, verse 11 again, Yahweh of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold or refuge. Do you believe that? The one who believes that simple, clear, unambiguous truth, the one who strives to practically cling to God by believing his promises that one can lay hold of all of these promises listed in this passage. When this day comes, you will not be afraid. You will not be afraid on this day because God is your refuge. You will exult from a stable city on that day because you have made God and nothing else your refuge. And when God is exalted across all the earth, then you will live to see that day. For most people reading this psalm, all, since the psalm was authored, for them to see this day, they will have to be resurrected to see this day. And so believe the promises of God. Practically make God your refuge by believing his word. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for uh, these words, even in a precious portion of scripture that uh, the significance of which can perhaps be, uh, has perhaps been veiled uh, from us for some time. I pray that these truths would be uh, precious to us, that we would learn to embrace you as a refuge specifically by faith. Um, just as Noah and just as Abraham and just as Moses and David and all of the faithful saints throughout the ages have done, have drawn near to you, have looked for an unshakable kingdom, an unshakable city to dwell in. I pray that we would take that same approach, that we would not be clever, find unique ways to pursue sanctification and rest in you, but that simply by clinging to your promises, we would know these truths by faith and that that certainty in this life on this day would preserve us for a future day, a better day when you cause morning to dawn, when you reign in Christ in your kingdom on earth. God, help us to persevere to see that day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.